Before we turn to Matthew 7, there's someone here who's believed from a young age that you're going to die early. You believed a lie. And the Lord says, unbelieve the lie. You shall fulfill your days. You have thought that you've had something within you that you're going to die young. And you thought God had shown that to you, but you're afraid. And he says, he says, no, that was not me. You will live and you will not die. You will fulfill your days. There's another person here, and maybe listening, I say here, meaning in the general audience. And you're wondering if a gentleman made it to heaven before he died. And, and the Lord says, he is with me. And furthermore, he says he apologizes for all the hurt and all the pain that he inflicted, and you will have a time of reconciliation when you're in heaven. Which part? There's someone, the Lord just, he told me, he said, there's someone here, gentleman who died, and you've been unsure of their salvation. And the Lord says, they are with me. And they're sorry for the great pain that they caused and inflicted and you'll have a time of reconciliation in heaven. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Someone else has doubted their salvation because of this. You've thought maybe in a few thousand years, I'm gonna be part of a rebellion to rebel and I'm gonna lose my salvation. And the Lord says, that's a lie and you need to get rid of that lie. You are sealed in him and you will not fall away even 10,000 years from now. You'll still be with him. Matthew chapter 7. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Do, does everybody believe that Jesus always tells the truth? Yes. Matthew chapter 7. Are you sure about that? Yes. You believe Jesus always tells the truth? Yes. Okay, Matthew chapter 7. Verse 22, excuse me, verse 23. If Jesus says, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, is he telling the truth? Yes. If he says, I never knew you, is he telling the truth? Yes. If he says, you are actually workers of iniquity, iniquity is a lifestyle of sin. It's not just a sin, it is a lifestyle of ungodliness. If Jesus is telling the truth, do you believe? If he says, I never knew you, that's never? Okay. Then why have you believed the people who come to him and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done marvelous works? I will admit to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Matthew chapter seven, let's look at verse 15. This is specifically for some people listening to, to me. That was, this is the, actually the first thing that he said to me. Verse 15, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are actually hungry wolves. Know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes out of thorns or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit and a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring bad fruit, neither can a bad tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. What's the subject? False believers. He will admit, I never knew you. That's no one here. Someone has been afraid because they have wondered of this, and this is the time, a change of season in your life, that you're going to unbelieve the lie. You're going to unbelieve your, your, incorrect misunder, your incorrect understanding of this passage and say, wow, he was not talking about me. You have to unbelieve the lie and believe the truth. What do I mean by that? In, in John 8, 44, Jesus talking to the Pharisees said, you're of your father, the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. When he speaks a lie, he is alone. He speaks it of himself. You understand? When Satan speaks a lie, when he speaks a temptation, when he does something, it's all by himself. He has no one to agree with him. Yeah. 
He's looking for somebody to agree with him because that agreement brings power, opens the door for him to have access into your life. Amos 3.3, 3, the Lord is contending with Israel and he says, can two walk together unless they're agreed? Two can't walk together unless you're in agreement. So Satan puts out there lies. I was on a Wednesday night service when I was at a Victory Christian Center. The pastor was Billy Joe Doherty. He was out of town, asked me to, to minister on the Wednesday night service. About 1,500 people there. And I got up and suddenly the father started talking to me. He said, there's a woman here who when she was about 12 years old, her mother said to her, you're not good, very good looking and you're not very smart, so you're going to have to work hard in this world. And as a young girl, she took that and that word took away hope and caused her to be despondent and to be depressed. And she believed that of herself. And soon she began cutting herself and soon she began thinking thoughts of suicide. She has come here tonight and she said, if I don't get a word, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna finish the job. I'm going to kill myself. So I spoke that out. I, I spoke that out. I, I prayed, I said, Satan, get away from her in the name of Jesus. And I said, you're gonna to have to unbelieve the lie. You've been agreeing with this lie since you were 12 years old. You have to believe the truth that the Lord has a purpose for your life. The Lord has grace in your life, that you are not ugly, you are not dumb, you will succeed, you have Christ in you, you have the mind of Christ. Start looking at, at what you have. Three weeks later at Wednesday night service, I wasn't ministering, Pastor Billy Joe was back in town. The lady pulled me aside. She said, do you remember three weeks ago? She said, I was that woman. She said, I came that night and said, I'm gonna go home and kill myself if, if I don't get a word from God. And she said, I have not had a thought of suicide since. She showed me the scars on her, on her arms and her wrists of previous attempts and the cutting that she did when she was a teenager. Two months later, I was going through the drive through at a Burger King of all things, and the lady who handed me my Whopper with fries was that woman. Three months later, she said, I've not had a thought about suicide since. She said, I'm totally set free. There was, there's someone here tonight or within my listening, uh, within the vo sound of my voice, and you've had similar thoughts where you've believed a lie. It's time to stop agreeing with the devil. Stop agreeing with the lie and believe God who says, I have a plan, I have a purpose. So thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. So Father, I pray for these people that you've specifically spoken to me about. And, and uh, well, you know, we just take authority over you, Satan. The thoughts of suicide, the despondency, the fear of, of losing their salvation, all those things. We take authority over you. We command those attacks to stop. We cast you out. Father God, now we... We ask you to, to send your spirit, to send your ministering angels according to how you see fit to minister to each person that that applies to. And we thank you for giving your great peace, your great assurance, your vision for the future. Hallelujah. Because he says for that one, he says, it's time to stop looking at how you're going to die and start thinking about how you're going to live. Amen. Say it again. It's time to stop thinking about how you're going to die and time to start thinking about how you're going to live. That's from the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. The Lord's good. The Lord's good. I promised tonight to share about um, heaven, and we have so many questions. And I'll say to those listening in, and I know there have been some folks who say, you know, we'd like to hear the questions, but for time's sake and, and convenience and just efficiency, someone in the, in, the, in the audience in the congregation will speak the question, I'll repeat it, and then we will, uh, then I'll do my best to answer it rather than just pass a mic around. Um, so let's go to the Gospel of Luke, if you will. Let's go to... Chapter 16, or, uh, 16, and I won't tell you the verse right now. Just find Luke 16. <laughs> As you know, the Lord started appearing to me, started visiting me back in April of 1986. Along the line, a few years later, he told me, he said, I'm going to allow a tour of heaven. I'm going to allow you a tour of heaven. And 
I said, is it a round trip? <laughs> Honestly, I said, I don't, I said, <laughs> so, I mean, seriously, because he said, I'm gonna allow you a tour of heaven. So I was, that was in the spirit, you know, in a visitation. And it wasn't until later that I said that to, to the father. I said, is this a round trip? Because I've got a wife, I've got a handicapped son, I've got two other little boys, you know, and, and I don't want a tour of heaven if I'm not coming back. And I actually, when, when it first happened, I was actually delayed it about three weeks because of that. And then he just assured me it was a round trip <laughs> ticket, <laughs> at least for that time. So, pastor of a little church and uh, in Southeast Colorado, and I was going into the sanctuary to pray, and I was kneeling down, I had my hands raised, my eyes were wide open, suddenly I heard my angel's voice, and I saw his forearm in the air, right above my arm, and he said, take my hand. My arm was out like this, but I watched my spirit man's arm come up out of my physical arm and grab hold of his hand. And when that happened, it was like a shoe, a foot popping out of a shoe I, or a popsicle popping out of the plastic. I just right up out. In fact, I was holding onto his hand like Lois Lane held onto Superman's hand. And I looked around and by the time I had the presence of mind to look around for the earth, I looked around, I could not find it. I couldn't find it. We were flying through space. And I, I can tell you, and I, I've told Barb, I've told so many people, it's not like Star Wars. It's not like whoosh, whoosh, there are points of light. The distances in space are just as far as the distances of the stars you see on Earth. The, the, it's so vast. It's so huge. I keep thinking I'm getting closer. I'm going to get closer to a star or to a galaxy or something like that. And it was like, there's just so much space. It's not like that. You look up there and say, wow, they're so far away. When you're flying through it, they're still that far away. <laughs> and about the time I realized I couldn't see earth at all or anything else, I felt our momentum shift. I felt us slowing down. And I looked up and we were coming up from beneath and we were, there was this huge walled, like 20 story high walled city. And we were coming up near one corner and it was rounded on the corner and that went to my left, clear, almost out of sight and to my right, almost out of sight. And every so often there were these huge pearl gates, like every couple hundred miles, every 300 miles, but my eyes were so good. And we came up over the wall. And as I came up over the wall, I looked out and I saw roof, rooftops and I saw every type of roof that you can imagine down through the ages, every country. There was everything from the, you know, in Eastern Europe, they have these onion bulb uh, tops to their churches. There were, there were flat roofs. There were row houses like you'd find in Philadelphia that have the, the same steps, the very common steps. They all go up to a, to a door, but the steps are side by side. There were boulevards. There were narrow streets. There were people walking around. And I thought, this is just a city. And I don't know why I'd be surprised. That's how the, <laughs> that's how the book of Revelation describes it, as the, the holy city, the heavenly Jerusalem. But to see it surprised me. Let me back up. When I came upon the wall, it's pure white, just light. But when I stared through the light, I could see the construction of the wall. I could see the huge blocks. I could see through the light and I'd see colors. And there were so many different colors and gemstones that were like four and five feet long that were extruded, kind of like you do a thing of Play-Doh, you know, and it just extrudes it into one piece. It was like that, just embedded in the walls. Not like a little diamond ring. I'm talking about people-sized rocks and, and stones and just, and, and smaller ones too, but it was nicely adorned, different colors and just quite amazing. And we came up over and, and then sat down in some grass that was about halfway up my shin a little taller, little white flowers and different colored flowers all around in the grass. And to the right were the houses. And then there was a, a stone wall on my right side. And there's a river that I assume was a, the river of life or a tributary of the river of life to my left. It was flowing like a, away from us. It was flowing uh, across. And <laughs> the first thing I noticed was my eyesight. 
I was able to look, there were some trees like a half mile distance, maybe a little more. And I just thought, I'd love, I don't know, I just wanted to see closer. And my eyes were able to zero in right on the leaf. And I wanted to look closer and I zeroed in more and I zeroed in more and I got able to see not only the cells but down to the molecules and they were vibrating. And there was kind of like a hum that was, that was going on. And the same thing, I looked at the flowers around me, I looked at the leaves, they all had a different frequency, a different humming, so to speak. And it all contributed not to, it wasn't like elevator music, it wasn't like this annoying background music or anything like that. It was just when I stopped and became aware of it, I was aware that there was this, this noise that all came together like an orchestra and it, I just knew it worshiped the Lord. It was just vibrating with the life of God. And e it was like each plant was a different instrument in an orchestra so that it all came together. It was just really fascinating. But when I got thinking on other things, I didn't really hear it. And the, 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 <laughs> the sky was kind of pastels and over to my right and further away was just bright white light like the sun might be coming up on the horizon, but I knew that was somewhere by the Father's throne. And <laughs> I looked at the river of life and it was making its own waves. And when I looked at the own waves, its waves, it's like it was happy. And I looked at it and I go, <laughs> because it would make me giggle. I giggled like a schoolgirl. I, I looked at it and, it just, <laughs> and I look away because it was so happy, this river of life. It was just these waves, it was making waves like it was leaping in joy just in and of itself. It was, it was amazing. And so I'd, I'd look away and I'm standing there and just kind of taking it all in. And there was an open space going on and on and then to my left were a bunch of trees. And on the other side, the, the grass grew all the way down to the river, like you have seen maybe in England or Ireland or something where it's lush and there's just long grass growing right down to the water. And on the other side, there was this rustle in the grass. Something was coming towards us. You know, and all you could see was like this rustling in the grass and got right to the end and it was our golden retriever, Abby, who had gotten hit by a school bus and killed, and we even put it on her, her little gravestone, it was January 3rd of 1989. And so I'm there in heaven about less than a year later. And it's Abby and she jumps over the river. And I'm talking, it's as wide as like from the front row to the back row, whatever that distance across the river would be, 50, 75 feet maybe, something like that, with one leap. And she had my pet monkey Tilly on her back. <laughs> I explained earlier when I was, 14, or my mom allowed me to buy a monkey that I named Tilly. And she died after a year and a half. And, and a couple years later, when I was born again, I went to where I buried Tilly. And, and that's where I said, Father, I don't, you know, there's horses in heaven. Why not monkeys? The logic of a, you know, 16, 17 year old. But I was thrilled. Tilly was riding Abby like a jockey riding a horse. And they leaped over and came over and and Abby sat down and Tilly jumped up and jumped up on my back just like she used to with one foot here and one foot here and her little head looking over, you know, just holding on to my hair. Just like, hey, how are you? So glad to see you, you know, assume the position just like we used to do when I was 14, 15 years old walking around the neighborhood. Some kids had a coonskin hat. I had a live monkey, you know, because she would sit with one foot here, one foot there, hold on to my hair. And boy, it was the 70s and I had curly blonde hair. So it was like an Afro that I didn't even try to have. You know, I think she felt like she could groom me because she'd run her little fingers in my hair. You know, look, anyway. She probably wondered what happened to my hair when she was in heaven. Um, and Abby looked up at me and she wasn't hot or sweaty, but she had, you know, that golden retriever kind of like look on the face with the tongue kind of to the side. And she looked at me and I heard her thoughts. She said, where is Barb and the boys? I head snapped around to my angel and I said, my dog just talked to me. <laughs> and he said, when you're in heaven, you can take part in the father's unlimited knowledge as you have need because it's governed by love. Say that again. 
When you're in heaven, you can take part of the you can take part in the Father's unlimited knowledge as you have need because it's governed by love. That's a principle that I have learned so much since. On earth, we we might look at Galatians 2:9 where it says that Peter, James, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace in Paul and in me and Barnabas and gave us the right hand of fellowship and agreed that they would go to the Jews and we'll go to the heathen. Perceiving the grace. That's how you walk in love. You know, in our network of house churches, we may have somebody who was in prison and a drug addict and everything, and now they're new in the Lord sitting right next to somebody with multiple degrees and a professional, and they have nothing in common except Jesus. The way you walk in love is you perceive the grace in one another. You ignore the the racial, socioeconomic, all those other issues, and and you love Jesus in them. You love the grace in them. Forget all the other stuff, and you just look for the grace. Look for the grace. Look for the grace. What has Jesus done in your life? You've got Christ in you. You're a living, breathing temple of God. What has he done in your life? That's how you walk in love. And so in heaven, when he said, when you're in heaven, you can take part of the, in the Father's unlimited knowledge as you have need because it's governed by love. It was just consistent with here on earth. It's the same thing. <laughs> and I looked back at Abby and it was just spirit to mind of what, I don't know how it was. I talked to her, but she understood. I said, they're not here now. It's just me. And she said, okay. Till he jumped down, got on her back. They leaped right over and went across the, the river, just like they started and went up, disappeared through the grass. And the angel said, the children in school really enjoy them. And I said, I want to know more. So we, we took one step off of the riverbank and that's all that was required to cross that. Just a little bit of effort. And we just floated like mid step, just frozen, just right across the riverbank to the other side. And I remember thinking at the time, when Jesus walked on the water, maybe that wasn't the first time he had ever walked on water. Because I realized we could have swum through that, we could have walked across the top of the water, but for whatever reason, the angel just chose, we just leaped across it with one step, one giant step. I still don't know the answer to that. And I haven't bothered to ask the Lord, you know, have you been swimming in the river of life before? Did you walk across that when you're in heaven? You know, I don't know. But we came to a place and uh, on the left side, there was a, what appeared to be a brick building and kids were playing out. And I, you know, can you imagine going to school in heaven? Kids, today we're going to have Sir Isaac Newton as your guest speaker. He's gonna teach you about higher mathematics and how he put together some things about gravity. He's learned a few things since then, but he's gonna talk to you. You know, there, if you look at a lot of the famous scientists, they were Christians and they had revelation. So can you imagine, can you imagine, it's like, okay, kids, hey, really exciting day today. Jonah's gonna come by and tell you what it was like to be in the belly of the fish. <laughs> you know, I mean, can you imagine? But they're playing. And, and like I said this morning, there was every kind of animal that every kid has ever played. Oh, please God, let my little fill in the blank. Puppy, goldfish, turtle, lizard, hamster, you know, whatever, be in heaven. The Father's so gracious. And kids were playing, there were kids wrestling with, um, uh, there was a black panther, there was some tigers, some bigger cats. Uh, There were just every kind of, just imagine a kid having an imagination to play with something, you know, big and dangerous. And the thing is, it was just like Abby and me. The kids were clearly in charge and clearly the higher form of being, but they understood everything about the animals that they were playing with, and there was communication between the two of them. And I don't know how that works. But I do know this. I read, sometime later, I read Josephus, who was the Jewish historian, who did a a history of the Jewish people for the Romans. His name's Josephus. And he said that in the Garden of Eden, the animals could talk. I think what he didn't understand was words of knowledge. I think Adam and Eve walked in the gifts of the Spirit 
what we have labeled for us today the gifts of the Spirit. I think Adam and Eve had words of knowledge and words of wisdom because Adam, Adam named all the animals. The Lord brought all the animals by Adam. And I heard a rabbi teach on it and he said, he said what it means when a, a Jewish person assigns a name, when we talk about a name for a child or something like that, it's according to their nature. It is understanding what their nature is what their purpose is. So when Adam named the animals, it just wasn't say, you're gonna be Bob the hippopotamus. It wasn't like that. It was the, the name was fitting for the type of animal and its place in, in the environment. And so, you know, there's, there's that element in heaven too. And I think Josephus just didn't understand the gifts of the spirit. But I think Adam and Eve walked in that. I think they knew by the spirit of God, the different things of the animals that were present in the Garden of Eden. And so in heaven, I wasn't surprised, and yet I was at, at so many animals there. And I encourage you, I, and I'll, I'll be real honest, uh, I'm not trying to populate heaven with pets or anything like that, but you know, when I prayed that, when I asked the father that Tilly would be there, Tilly'd been dead for a couple of years. I mean, I wasn't a Christian at the time. You know, in a couple of years I came back and I said, I said, Father, if it's possible, make Tilly in heaven. She was important to me before I met you and you know, and there she was. So that is where I shared this morning about the girl with the honey-colored hair, the golden hair. Two girls playing and, I, and beautiful hair. And the angel said that these girls died of cancer in Houston, Texas. And the angel said that when the, the girl on earth had beautiful hair and it was her pride and joy, and when she got sick and in the treatment for cancer, she lost all her hair. And she told everyone it didn't matter. It was no problem. And he said, your father knows that she was being brave and she was just putting forth a, a good front. And he, so when she came to heaven, he made sure she had beautiful, rich hair, richer than what she had in heaven. And it was beautiful golden honey colored hair. And the little girl, like I shared this morning said, I didn't know the Lord when I got sick, but people came by, especially later, and started reading to me different stories, including Bible stories. And one day I, and one day I just said, Jesus, I wanna know you. I want you, Jesus. And the little boy that I shared about, um, the little Indian boy from the subcontinent of India, who was very, very poor and the oldest in his family, and they didn't have enough for, for all the kids. And so he found himself out on the streets trying to survive. And uh, I, I got the idea he would try to help his family somehow, but at the same time, he was like on his own. I really didn't ask the details of his relationship with his family because it's so foreign to me that something like that would happen. But he said he stole, he ate garbage, he sniffed glue, he sniffed things to, to dull the, the pain in his stomach over hunger and everything. And one day he looked out between the buildings and there was a, a field. There, was grass, there were grasses and flowers and birds and butterflies and bees and all sorts of stuff, insects. And he said, I want to know the creator. There has to be a God who created that beauty. I want to know that creator. And when he came walking over to me, he told me the story and he said, that when I came here, he said, I, I learned his name is Jesus. The, the goodness of the Father is amazing, just amazing. When, we're not gonna get to that right now. I told you to turn Luke 16, but don't worry about it, we won't get there. <laughs> I don't think. Um, <clears throat> the next thing I saw was stuff that I, didn't really share for years just because I, it just sounds different, okay? But we're standing there and out of the trees come a group of people walking. They just come out of the woods like they walked through the forest and they came out to the open area and they were headed to where I assumed was the throne. They were headed in the direction of that bright light. And I asked them and they were a good distance away but we could talk normally and I said, I said, where did you come from? Where do you live? Because over here I had seen all kinds of houses and you know, row houses and different kinds of houses. And I, clearly it was a, the city and this is like an open area. And, and the one leader said, we lived in the trees on earth. We're tree people. We lived in tree houses. 
So when coming to heaven, that's what we're comfortable with. And we have tree houses in the forest. And it was, year, it was a couple years later, I, I was happening upon a PBS special or something like that, you know, public television on nature. And I found out that there's a, tr- a group of people, I think in New Guinea, that live in tree houses. And I went, wow, I know where, I know <laughs> where they came from. I know where those people came from and how they came to the Lord, I have no idea. But we walked along. We, I'll just share about some people. It's a slightly out of order, but I'll share it anyway. Um, I shared a little bit this morning to the question about, the question was, will there be families and reunion in heaven? And the little girl sitting there under a tree with her back to the tree and, a, and her little brother crawling all over her. Uh, lap and you know, just all around, just like a toddler, just like a baby would do. And all these people, 14 people, um, and they weren't just seven couples. There were a couple that weren't there yet, some that are, I assumed were alive on earth. Uh, cousin, cousin, uncle, aunt, etc. cetera. And, and that's where I, I, I said, where are the parents? And the angel said, have you not read what Paul wrote to the Ephesians? For this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And he said, there is but one family in heaven and earth. So where possible, relatives raise children. There was a woman, let me put it this way. We were walking along and there on my left was a, a house that was like a small Victorian style house. Like you might see from the 1920s or something it had a partial wraparound porch, two story, nice covered porch and upstairs and little decorations that told me it was a Victorian style. And I thought, okay, that's like, that's like 100 years old. You know, that's, that's like turn of the century, turn of the 21st century, 20th century rather. And behind the house was a mud hut. You know, just baked earth. And, and so I walked by and I thought, what a pretty little house. And there was a chair on the porch and everything. And I, and I thought, and I told the angel, I said, can we just walk, take this little path down alongside the house? And so uh, I did. And I, like I said, I, I didn't know how old the house was. But when it got around back in this, this little hut, a woman comes out and she said, I, I lived in Kenya and I lived and grew up in a, in a house, in a hut like this, in a house like this. And she said, that's where I'm most comfortable. But I had always seen those American houses that look so nice in magazines. And I, I long to have a house like that, a proper house like that. And she said, when I came to heaven, she said, the father let me have my house. And she said, and I spend time there and I sit on the porch and talk to people as we walk by and relatives will come by and everything. She says, but I'm comfortable just on a daily basis just to spend time in what I'm familiar with. Fascinating, really fascinating. The next part is Well, this is where I shared, I think on Friday night, I shared about, it's all blurry to me. (laughs) I'm glad to be here, but at this point, where did I, what did I share when? But we came to a place where there were these angels standing shoulder to shoulder almost with just a little space between them, across and down, and they were all holding, like you may remember, uh, but some people maybe online weren't participating in Friday night, but they were standing like this and they had this sphere of light that was hovering. It wasn't touching either the bottom hand or the top hand, it was hovering, oblong and fuzzier white light and glory on the outside and then it got more dense towards the middle. And I stood there and I wanted to know, I desperately wanted to know what were those angels holding? And suddenly, as soon as I thought, Father, I'd love to know what they're holding. As soon as I said that, my eyes were open and I looked, I was able to see that first one and it was a baby growing, like a baby growing in the womb. And again, my head snapped around to the angel and he said this, this is where all the miscarried and aborted babies go. And in the ages to come, they will grow up and they will fulfill their destinies. 
Now, the next thing I was shown, I was just amazed. I mean, I knew from Exodus 20 that, that a baby in the womb, God considers life. There's a passage in there in Exodus, I think it's 22, where there's a pregnant woman and she happens to become involved in a fight between two men and, and she gets injured so that she loses, as the King James Version says, the fruit of her womb. Then the man has to give life for life. The man who caused that injury to cause her that miscarriage had to give life for life. So I know that the Lord considers that unborn baby alive. But it was still eye-opening. So the next thing was, of course, what happens after that. I did not see the transition from those angels standing there at practically attention like this, solemn, solemn with their task of letting that baby develop within that sphere almost, oblong thing of light. I didn't see that. But the next thing as we walked along was a vast open space with green grass. And to my left was a wall that was about 10 feet high, about three meters high, and a flooring that came out about the same distance, about 10 feet. And where the, we might call it concrete or or cement. It was like that, it was solid floor. And where that stopped, the green grass went on, just a vast amount of green grass. And this half wall, this L-shaped wall went on, like as far as the eye could see, it just went on and on. It was very long. And out in the grass were people and angels playing with children. Toddlers, kids who could barely walk, There were, in the L-shaped part, there were angels and people taking care of babies. And it looked like a nursery. It looked like a, you know, bassinet type of thing, the four, the little play area with the nets and and everything. And it was all in, but it was in this, confined to the space there where the floor was like 10 feet wide and the wall went up. And, And there was just all this equipment around here and people were tending to the babies and everything. So I never saw the transition from the angels to how they got there. I still don't know. And, and that was the very first time that I inquired to the angel about why there were angel or why there were angels helping to take care of children. And he just made the comment. He said, he said that there are people on earth who feel gifted and love to take care of little children and babies. And in heaven, they can fulfill that to their heart's desire. But there are also angels involved to help as needed. And he said, and many of those that are helping are relatives of those children. So I didn't think anything of it at the time. I didn't think to ask the question until later when I saw the little girl and her little brother playing under the tree and noted that mom and dad were missing. So, so all, these, all this is going on with these, these babies and, and little kids and angels and people. And, and you've got to understand, angels look like guys that are like 30 years old. No wings, they look like people, but there's a definite distinction between angels. They've got the same, they've got different complexion. There's, there's copper colored guys. There's, there's all the complexions, just like people, you know, bronze uh, skin tone. There's, but there's definitely a difference between people and angels. And I, I, to this day, I can't put it in words that I would know what it, how to describe it to you, except the innocence of angels is such that they're like little kids. Let me explain this experience and try to put that in there. Hold that thought, me in heaven, and let me just explain this. When I was on staff at Victory Christian Center, where I was the director of the Bible school, we met in a basketball arena on the campus of Oral Roberts University. We met in the basketball arena. So the floor would be covered, and that's where the pulpit and the worship team was, but it meant that the congregation is in an arena above all that. Okay, just like a football arena, basketball court, etc. So because of my position, I was in the first couple rows, but I, you know, it, but I was up like this a little bit. So, you know, the worship team's over here. There's a couple steps down. Pastor sits there. And, you know, I was in the second or third row maybe. So I'm looking down. And in the part of the worship that was really vertical, suddenly I see about 50 or 60 angels dancing. So, and they, and they, it's so innocent, it's like children. Imagine... Anybody, any young men here close to 30 years old? No? Okay, so I'm back there. Imagine seeing a bunch of guys do doing around and dancing before the Lord 
but they have the innocence of little children. They are so pure, so innocent, like little children. And in front of me, in front of me, there were a bunch of angels that were doing the best I could describe it as a cross between square dance and American square dance and Israeli dances. There was like going into the middle, putting your hands up, everybody out, swing around, go like this, hands up, get in a line, hey. I mean, it was just, and they're so innocent and they all look like to be in their early 30s. And they were joining and the congregation was just worshiping, but they were having fun. And here's the thing, what struck me was, unlike some who would do like a dance with an invis invisible partner thinking they're worshiping, you know, they're dancing with Jesus or something in, in the congregation, in the, the worship, these guys were just dancing not unto the Lord, but just in his presence. If you've ever seen the original uh, movie called The King and I with Yul Brenner and Deborah Carr, there's a scene in there where Yul Brenner as the king is just sitting there and all his children are just playing there. They're not playing unto the king. They're just playing in the presence of the king. And he just happens to be observing them. That's what the angels were doing. They weren't dancing unto the Lord. They were just experiencing the Lord's presence and just dancing because they enjoyed it. And my angel, because I'm up a couple of three steps and my angel is down on the floor and he's leaning honestly, he's leaning against the post, kind of like this, and he's just watching his friends. And I looked at him and I said, angels dance? You guys dance? You know, all these proverbial things. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? You know, that sort of a thing. And it's like, and I looked at him and I said, you guys dance? And he turned around and he said this, that which is given from heaven is enjoyed in both realms. And he turned back around to watch his buddies. That which is given from heaven is enjoyed in both realms. There are songs out there that you know are heaven sent. They're heaven composed. It's enjoyed in both realms. Can you, we probably more than one of us have imagined that, that uh, is it John Newton who wrote Amazing Grace when he survived the going around the Cape in the bad weather? And, and How Great Thou Art and some of the classic hymns. Aren't there some of you, if you're like me, I thought, man, that's gonna be amazing to sing that in heaven because I know that some of those old hymns are inspired by the Lord. That which is given from heaven is enjoyed in both realms. I know that there are books that are inspired by heaven. Worship songs. Doesn't have to be in the billboard top 40. You can be sitting there by yourself and no one will ever hear it but you and the Lord, but you're singing out of your spirit and it's a melody and a tune that the Lord has given. That which is given from heaven is enjoyed in both realms. Amazing. So that kind of innocence, that kind of innocence. And so here are angels playing with little children and adults playing with little children in heaven on this grassy area and newborns and the younger ones, the extreme babies were in this area where it was like a wall, an L-shaped wall with about 10 feet of space and just went on for some distance. And suddenly, out in the middle of the grass, some distance from me, there was a rustle in the grass, just a stirring, and everybody turned around to look. Imagine a ramp or an escalator, you know, an escalator going up, Imagine that beneath this floor, beneath the grass, and I forget, you know, I'm in the high desert, so grass is a green plant that grows. <laughs> we have to mow it. Back east, we have to mow. We have these machines called lawnmowers, and they come along and cut off the grass. There's, there's, we have house church in, in, in more, many more friends in Phoenix. And I'm amazed at how so many of what they call yards is, is rocks and astroturf and stuff like that. It's like, oh, honey, better, better pin down the astroturf. It's gonna be windy today. You know, it's just, but this was grass and it was rustling. So you can imagine if there was a ramp under the ground and what I saw running up was the, at first the top of a woman's head. And she continued to run from my right to left. And there's, over here's the wall with all the babies there. And she's running. And first I see the top of her head. And then it's like she's running up a ramp. 
And then I see more. And as I stare, she's running up. And so I gradually see more and more of her body as she runs up. Her arms are outstretched. As she's running, as she's running, my angel says quietly, oh, oh, by the way, and there's a baby that an angel is holding, all wrapped in blankets, but a baby, and he's standing facing the wall. She's over here running up like running up a ramp coming. She's got her arms out like this. My angel says, she lost the baby in childbirth and she died shortly after. And she goes running up like, a, like running up a ramp, just full speed, her arms outstretched. I have, when I share this, I have to hold back the tears even now, so many years later. There are times I've had where I felt like I was an interloper, where I was watching, I was looking at something that was private and sacred and holy and intimate. And I was just getting a tour of heaven. And so I, I felt like I was a stranger watching something that, you know, I just felt self-conscious in that, but I watched. And that girl, that young woman ran with her arms outstretched. And I watched and I see this. And at the last second as she's running with her arms outstretched, the angel turns around and goes and hands her the, the baby. She, she grabbed that baby. She just, she just grabbed that baby and hugged it and went just spinning around. Oh, man. Everybody was watching that. And everyone seemed comfortable with it. They probably had seen things like that many times before, but for me, it was, it was amazing, sacred. And I think of them now, I think of the loss on earth of whoever lost that young woman but she, that her heart was for her baby. And she just rejoiced at the goodness of the Lord. And now, you know, they're, they're in heaven raising her, raising her child. Special, special, special. The, yeah. Um, there was a man that I had known about for about a year before he died. He was the last generation of a rancher in Montana. His family had homesteaded a ranch. And he, when I knew, when I got to know him, he was having real heartache because it was his generation. He felt like he was failing his grandparents and everything else because they had homesteaded that ranch. But he's older, he's in his early 60s at that time and none of the kids were interested in the ranch and he was gonna have to sell it and he felt like he'd failed, you know, the family. And he'd had a rough life, but I saw him there in heaven. His his wife's name was Bonnie. And he was walking along the river. There was part of the river of life. I don't know what part, I don't know how it goes. I know Revelation 20, 22.1 22.1 says that there's a river flowing from the throne. And I don't know if it divides out into anything. I, you know, I don't know. I just, they were walking along the river and there was a man that he was talking to on his left and I knew somehow by the spirit, I knew it was his dad. And off in the distance, I could see where they were walking to, there were all these homes. They were rectangular. They were just rectangles with a solid roof line going the, the rectangle. They're just rectangles, little like block houses, but, but kind of scattered around in a rough circle around a central like courtyard. Nothing formal, just an open area in, in the middle of all these different houses. And I asked the angel, I said, what are those? And he said, that's the family ranch. And I said, how big is it to have a ranch in heaven? He said, you would think of it as about a thousand acres. And as they walked and talked, the father and the son, they walked and talked. I asked the angel, I said, so what are they talking about? And he said, it's none of your business. <laughs> but I can tell you it involves the time when he was 17 years old and he and his dad had a big fight and he ended up leaving the house. And now they're talking through it. And he turned around with that. He turned around and he said, he, said, he just looked at me and he said, Tell Bonnie I'm doing well, I'm fine. And she'll be with me soon enough, but she needs to go on and live her life. 
He turned around and kept walking. I want to explain this about heaven because it's, it's foreign to our thinking. I've shared it before when I said you're larger on the inside than you are on the outside. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. And I asked the question on Friday night, I said, how many apples are, come from one apple seed? One apple seed. Next time you eat an apple, look at the seeds, half a dozen seeds or so in the core. Take out one seed and think how many apple trees are in you? How many apples are in will be produced by that apple tree. The kingdom of heaven is like a seed, and that's why I said you are bigger on the inside than you are on the outside. You have dreams, you have hopes. Right now, you've got a, maybe a home, an apartment, a car, whatever the case is, that's the extent of your life on the outside. But on the inside, you have dreams. On the inside, you have gifts. Some of us are old enough that we know some of those gifts and some of those interests will not come to pass in this life. Too much, too much time has gone by. There's not the money, the time, or the energy for some of it, frankly. I'm gonna need a glorified body to do what, I, what I'd like to do. Explain it this way. You know, people talk about heaven. How big is heaven? Well, it appears to be 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. And people have argued over the shape of heaven. Is it a cube? Is it just a, a square? Is it a pyramid? because all that the book of Revelation talks about is if you put the cubits into feet, it's about 1,500 miles. But it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. So let's take apart one beam of light that comes from the sun. Does anybody remember the name of how you remembered the colors that make up one beam of white light that comes from the sun? Roy G. Biv. Anybody learn that in school? No? Okay, the colors of a white beam of light, within the, what makes that beam of light a white beam of light is red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Roy G. Biv. <clears throat> okay, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Anybody been into a paint store or a Lowe's or a Home Depot and you've been to the paint aisle? You see the Valspar display? the Glidden display? Have you seen all the cards that are there just to define something that's off-white? We have white, we have off-white, we have ivory, we have ichru, we have eggshell. It's like, just give me white or give me gray or something. Have you seen all those shades? How about the reds? This is red, this is burnt red, this is sundown, this is sunrise. Where do they come up with the names? There are people that get paid to come up with all the names for the different shades of red. Okay, so let's forget that, that beam of light. And remember, 1 John 1, 5, God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. So let's take one beam of light. Let's look at red. Now let's just look at red with no other things other than red. Now you're in that paint store. You're in that paint department. You see all the cards of the different shades of red, okay? Okay. Each one is a different wavelength of light. Imagine each one of those is a century in time. Imagine this is one little card would be 1600 to 16, 61, 16, I don't know, 16, I haven't gone back that far. 1600 to 16, 100. 16, yeah. 17, thank you. Yeah, that's right, I was going 10 years. So imagine that. And you can fit all the people who are in heaven in that 100 years from 1600 to 1700, and it's just one little shade of red or yellow. Uh-oh. And imagine that that is a, a, an image, a picture of what heaven is like somehow there is more room on the inside than there is on the outside. I can't, wrap, I'm, I've, I can't wrap my head around it because it's so contrary to our thinking, but somehow I know it to be true. All the people who have ever lived that are in heaven all coexist together in the same space, but it's like multidimensional. 
It's amazing. Questions at this point about this? Okay. Mm -hmm. White light has all the different colors in it and all the color spectrum, that's my point. It all combines to make white light. It, and I don't know how red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet combine to make white light. We see the separation of colors at sunrise and sunset when the dust in the air separate out some of the wavelengths and we say pretty, we see pretty reds and, and pinks and blues and yellows. I have no idea. Those different colors, for the sake of everyone listening, those different colors can be used for different purposes, exactly. And there are, you're right, and so just imagine, in my point being, that, that within that beam of light, there's all these other wavelengths, and yet somehow they exist within that beam of light. Hope I haven't lost you. But it's like an apple seed. How many apples are in that one apple seed? How many trees, apple trees, are in there? Amazing. So, yes. Are there, say that again, please. Are, does our born again spirit exist within the dimension of heaven? Yeah, we are citizens of that kingdom right now. How many, of you, how many of you have felt in worship, you have felt like, you've, like in the spirit you're crawled, you've crawled up on the Father's lap? Or in the spirit you felt like the Lord is hugging you? It, a woman can even feel sometimes like the Lord, you know, ran his fingers through her hair, not in a romantic, not in a sexual way, but just my daughter, I love you. I paid the price for you. You're important to me. Anybody feel that? That's happening in the spirit. It's a good question, Let's, and we will go to Luke 16, because I'm going to cover it in the morning, too, but I had to go to Luke 16, 19 through 31, and I told you, eh, forget it. But I'll cover this again tomorrow morning in a different context. But in Luke 16, 19 through 31, it's a story of two men who died, a rich man and a beggar named Lazarus. The Lord used this when he taught me about how the Father communicates. My point tonight is just that both men died, both had their bodies buried on the earth, but in their respective places in the earth, they saw one another, they heard one another, they had all their senses. And that is why with your physical senses, you sense the physical world, and with your spirit man, you sense the spirit realm. There was a, a Wednesday night, I was very, very tired, and Yet by my job, I had to go to the Wednesday night service. And because of my position and I was in the front row and all that, and the worship was going on and it was, it was good worship and all that, but I was just tired. And I, and I felt the presence of the Lord, so I assumed the position, which means I was on my knees and I had my forehead to the floor. And I'm in the front row in front of the platform just by virtue of my position. I was there and so I had the room and I just, you know, hit the position and I just was, I was just tired and I was just worshiping. But I felt the presence of the Lord. And the Lord came over. I saw him on the right side walking over. Interestingly, he spoke to a man named Will who was in the church who was deaf and mute. And he spoke to him. And you can, it's amazing. When, when the Lord would talk to Will, he would just go nuts. He was just like, you know, just, he was just so excited. And the Lord walked over to me. He walked over to me and he stood directly in front of me. And my head is on the ground. And the folds of his, I looked up like this, and the folds of his robe are right in my face. It's in my physical face, you just see John assuming the position on his knees, heads down before the Lord. In the spirit, Jesus was standing right in front of me and the folds of his robe were in my face and he was going back and forth like this, shifting his weight from one foot to the other. And the robes were just brushing across 
my face. And with each pass, I was refreshed. And they had an aroma about them. They had a smell about them. Sweet, but kind of like cinnamon and some other, I don't know, I've never spelled it since. Please don't send me anointing oil, please. Don't, I've mentioned it in the past and then in the mail I get all these little vials of does it smell like this and so and so had this a similar experience and they say it smells like this and or God gave me this formula one night and so here I'm sending, please don't. I'm just telling you that, that the folds of his robe just brushed across my face and I felt refreshed. And I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And there was a student of mine named, her name was Star. If she's listening, hello, Star. Her full name is Starry Dawn. Because when she was born, it was a Starry Dawn and her dad had great imagination. I said, I'm gonna name my daughter Starry Dawn. And they are pastors in, uh, I think it's Zinio, Ohio now. Uh, she and her husband, Nathan, great people. But, but Star came up to me one time when I was teaching a class and she said, did you know there was an angel standing behind you this whole class? Or did you know that the glory of the Lord was on you in the class? And so she could see things in the spirit uh, from time to time. So the Lord is, is there doing this, I'm getting refreshed. And understand this, physically, I, somehow it was refreshing in my spirit man, but it affected my physical. I didn't smell his robes with my physical nose. I've smelled it in my spirit. And he, he looked at me and he said, star knows that I'm here, so I'm gonna go talk to her. And he started walking like that. And I, I went, Lord, thank you so much. What was that? And he said, look it up. <laughs> and walked on to star. I talked to star later. I said, were you aware the Lord was there? Because he said he was gonna go talk to you. And she, she said, no. She said, you know, there was some stuff going on in my spirit, but I didn't see the Lord from that standpoint, but he deposited something in her nonetheless. So I went home and I looked it up. It's Psalm 45, Psalm 45, and verses seven and eight say, I'll give you a chance if you wanna turn there. And I'm, I'm sharing this to share the distinction between your physical senses and your spiritual senses. On my visit to heaven on earth, it lasted about 40 minutes but I felt like I was hours and hours and hours in heaven. You're in that realm and time just stands still. Have, any, have you ever been praying? Have you ever been worshiping and like an hour goes by and you go like, wow, that felt like 10 minutes. Okay, you've experienced it when you're in the spirit like that. But Psalm 45 verses seven and eight. You love righteousness, you hate wickedness. Therefore God, your God, that is the Father, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. All your clothing smells of myrrh, aloes, and kasha out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made you glad. That's, and it was like myrrh, aloes, and kasha. Yeah, that's it. Kind of, kasha is a, a type of cinnamon. I was refreshed that night. Amazing. Amazing. Would I say what? Was that the hem of his garment? It was the folds of his garment. And it was down near the hem. But it was just so, <laughs> it's just so, what was that, Lord? Thank you. Look it up. You know, it's just classic. Anyway, um, back to heaven. Uh, for time's sake and everything, I want to I just talk about being before the Father's throne. Um, And again, I wanna say it this way. If you're in the spirit, you can see everything there is to see in heaven. Isaiah, excuse me, Exodus chapter 33, verse seven, says that the Lord, that the glory would come upon the tabernacle and Moses would enter into where the glory was. And it says, the Lord talked to Moses face to face like a man talks to his friend. But a few verses later in verse 11 and, and such, Moses is up on the mountain all by himself and he wants to meet with the Lord and, and he says, show me, oh, this is too good. We gotta turn there, Exodus 33. I, I was setting the context from verse seven through 11 
where Moses, Moses took the tabernacle and moved it outside of the camp because they were so rebellious. It's like, we can't have God's presence here. He'd kill them all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't, you, the physical, ba- I mean, these guys are not born again, so they can't, you, you can't just contain in the earth body the presence of the Lord. It, we're, we're of the earth. And let me explain, we're gonna take a little rabbit trail. Some, and this will, this will help. Has anybody ever been, again, to borrow Catherine Coleman's term, slain in the spirit? Okay. How many people get goosebumps? Feel heat? Okay. Here's, here's the way it is. This is the reason why. Our bodies are of the earth. All right. And so if you've ever had an electric range, you guys have an electric stove top or you've been around one before? They work because the coil on the top resists electricity. It's not like a copper wire where the electricity runs through it and you get electrocuted. There are other ingredients in there to resist the flow of electricity. Because it resists the flow of electricity, it heats up. So the more heat electricity you allow into that coil, the hotter it gets. Okay? So our bodies are similar. When the presence of the Lord is there, you may feel goosebumps. You may feel a warmth on your body. You may feel flushed. This is your body reacting to the spirit realm. Now let's suppose the Lord turns the power up a little bit more. Then a person could be slain in the spirit. Just your strength leaves you and down you go. It could be a trance. I've seen people with a shaft of light and they, they're in a trance. That means your physical senses are suspended. Had a time in a chapel at the Bible school, part of the worship team was there and, and behind me was a, a lady who was part of the worship team and the worship was really good. And I looked behind her and there's a shaft of light. She's just encased in the shaft of light and she's standing there like this. With her eyes closed and she's just standing in that shaft of light. The chapel ended, the worship team goes off. It's time for the next class. The guy who was teaching next, was his name is Jerry. And I, and I told about this woman, I said, she's in a trance uh, in the spirit. So if you could just teach your class and don't worry about her behind you on the platform, just let the Lord deal with her. And he said, yeah, sure, no problem. And about, 40, about 35, 40 minutes into the class, she suddenly like came out of it. Well, see, what was going on in her life is this. She and her husband had been drug users, especially her husband had been a drug user before. And this is, you're talking about 1997. And her husband got AIDS because of a dirty needle. And then they got married and gave her AIDS. And they were both sick with AIDS. And she died within a year or two later. But the Lord was gracious and just talked to her and just dealt with her and was so kind to her in this trance. She was on a high. And some of it she didn't know. She didn't know with her mind what the Lord had deposited within her, but she just, he just, she just knew that he did a work. So you go warm, you go, Barb, let me explain this. Barb was at a Charles and my wife, Barb, when we were teenagers at a Charles and Francis Hunter meeting and the spirit of God would come on her and her right arm would start to shake. And Charles was so, so gentle. And he called her up front in front of, you know, a thousand people or whatever. And he said, you feel the presence of the Lord? She said, yes. And he said, now, I want you to take control of your body because the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So you're actually in charge. The Lord won't cause you to to lose control. And and he said, so I want you to think about just controlling that, but still be aware of the presence of the Lord. And so she was able to control it and stop the shaking. And he said, do you still feel the presence of the Lord? She said, yeah. He said, very good. And he just, and he let her sit down. Okay, let's, let's talk about you trance, slain in the spirit. Let's turn up the power a little bit more. If the Lord turns up the power a little bit more, you can be unconscious for, you know, for a time. He turns it up a little bit more. You know what happens? You're dead. Your earth body can't handle his presence. You know what happens when he turns it up a little bit more? Your earth body is transformed into a glorified body. The power is such that the molecules of your earth body become glorified. And that's when the dead are raised. That's when the rapture happens. 
So if you've ever experienced the presence of the Lord like that, just understand you're like that electric coil on a stove. And each person seems to have a different reaction. It's just our bodies are made of the earth. So we're like that coil resisting the electricity and different things will happen in different ways. In Exodus 33, verse 11, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. But you'll notice verses nine and 10 where it says, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door and the Lord talked with Moses. So the Lord, when Moses is in the spirit, he can talk to the Lord face to face. But in verse, but we go down here and in verse 18, Moses asks the famous question, I beseech you, show me your glory. That, the Hebrew word is kabod, K-A-B-O-D. It means what you're made of. It means what you're made of. Show me your substance. Show me what you're made of. He'd talk to him face to face, but he's still hungry. I wanna know what you're made of. So in the King James Version it says, show me your glory. It means substance. Show me your substance. So in verse 20, he says, well, you can't see me and live. I'm gonna put you in a cleft of the rock. So the difference between being in the spirit or being in the flesh. When, he's in, when the spirit of God descends on the tabernacle, Moses is in there, they talk face to face because he's in the spirit. When the apostle John is in, in Revelation 1.10, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard a voice behind me like a trumpet and many waters. I turned and I, he saw the Lord in glory. And in chapter four and verse two, he said, I heard a voice saying, come up here. And I looked and there was a door in heaven and I was in the spirit and taken to heaven. And there he saw the father God on his throne. 24 elders around the cherubs, clear flooring before it, rainbow over it, crying out, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Chapter five, I cried because there were scrolls and no man was found worthy to open the scrolls and to open the seals thereof. And he said to me, don't cry for the lion of the tribe of Judah has overcome. And in chapter five and about verse seven, it says, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. That's the son coming to the father. The apostle John saw all that and wrote it down for us. When you're in the spirit, you can see the father. Amazing. So there I was. And I, at the father's throne. He's similar to what Daniel describes him which is uh, kind of a white curly hair. I didn't see him as Ezekiel saw him, talking about how he had fire from his loins up and fire from his loins down in Ezekiel chapter one. And Ezekiel saw the rainbow around the throat and the clear flooring. I saw the clear flooring. I was on the clear flooring. It's like tile work. Fits in perfectly, slightly, slight bevel, but beautifully fitted. Clear as can be. And I was there on my knees before the father off to the side. The, cher the cherubs are about five and a half feet tall. They're not very big, multi-winged. And that's when, <laughs> like I had shared earlier, the father looked to his left, he looked at me down there and he said, I'll be back. He's got a beard. The cherubs, began beating two wings each. It just went whoo, whoo. Do you, you, Physics are this, when a helicopter is coming towards you, you hear the wop, 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 wop. Those are miniature sonic booms. The speed of the aircraft is moving towards you and the speed of the rotor coming towards you break the sound barrier. So when they're coming to you, you get this wop, 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 wop. It's miniature sonic booms. And when it goes away, all you hear is the engine going, you know, like a helicopter. But when it's coming to you, it's wop, 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 wop. So now every time you hear that wop, 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 you know, oh, a helicopter's coming close to me, coming towards me. That's what it sounded like with those, with those cherubs. Wop, 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 wop. And suddenly there's there this iridescent dust, this iridescent glory cloud, this iridescent particles, every color. You've seen it before on 
reptiles and stuff like that, just iridescence. And suddenly, as it stirred up all around them, almost obscuring them, the, the whole thing just bursts into flame. And there's just this amazing sound. And I, I saw through the flame and I saw the two on my side reach down and they picked up the platform and they put it on their shoulders and lifted it up, almost like a helicopter, just lifted it up and the father said, I'll be back and banked out in a way. And I have no idea where he went. I literally was just sitting there, not sitting, kneeling there going like, what do I do now? And, and I'm processing this, Ezekiel chapter one. Um, I'm processing, you know, things that I know and, and thinking, okay, he's still Father God. He still knows all things. I can worship wherever I am. If I'm in my living room, I can worship. If I, you know, all the different things going through my mind. And it seemed like about a half an hour went by, but I'm sure, I don't know what it was. But he came back and the whole process reversed itself and sat down and he said, I told you I'd be back. There seemed to be about six st steps up and then the seventh, you get to him. But he's an average size and just the glory and the power around the Father. But it feels completely at home, completely normal. It's like when the Lord is around, you feel his presence like normal, but it's just a little more intense. But it's not unusual. You think, oh, I don't know what I'd do if I saw Jesus. Yeah, you've got his presence already in you already. There's nothing more to it beyond that other than turning up the power. But that presence, that peace, when you check in your spirit on the inside of you, that presence is there. That's where, that's where he is. It's just when he's there, it's just more intense. My, my. Thoughts, questions? Pardon me? I want that. I want that. Well, I, you know, I just encourage people, don't seek, a, don't seek an experience. Yeah. But to get to know the Father. To get to know the Father. Um, I'm trying to think of all the things that I've seen in heaven. There's different things I could tell you about. I don't know. Any questions? I'll just, I'll leave it at that for right now. Question, yeah. What's the condition of making it to heaven? The, the, uh, the question was, what's it, what is the criteria for making it to heaven? Because we're taught the four spiritual laws. We're taught, you know, ex ask Jesus into your heart and all that stuff. And yet I talked about the, like the Indian boy and stuff like that. You know, we're told to judge the fruit of a person's life, but we're told not to judge their love walk, not to judge their heart, not to judge their walk with the Lord. So uh, that realm of the heart is the Lord. I make no judgment on that. I have no idea. But I do know, you know, a good book, if, you, if you're interested in this, it, it's interesting. Um, there's a book called Eternity in Their Hearts by Don Richardson. It's a little scholarly, but it's, it's a good book. You, you'll get the point about 20 pages in, you'll get the points that he's making, but it's called Eternity in Their Hearts by Don Richardson. And it, it, what he does is he goes back into ancient peoples and how they all have a commonality that they worship this God who was the creator. He was benevolent, he was good. And the anthropologists just kind of um, lump it all together and call him the sky God because it's common throughout all ancient cultures that the sky God is good, he is the creator, he's benevolent, he's kind to people, and all the ancient peoples had, had a sky God, had some good God who was the creator. See, what we don't realize, if you look, look at Hebrews chapter one, let me, let's take this little side trip here. Hebrews chapter one. Some of my favorite. Sorry, I'm looking through some of my 
notes and things that I could share. But Hebrews chapter one, yeah, don't need to turn there. It says this, God, who in many ways and many parts spoke in times past to the fathers through the prophets. So I want you to think about that. God, who in many ways and many parts spoke in times past to the fathers through the prophets. In many ways and parts. Some of those ways, the types and shadows on the tabernacle. There were types and shadows of Jesus. How about the Psalms? You know, many ways he spoke to the fathers through the prophets. Many ways, many parts. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son, by whom he, uh, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So in ancient times, the Lord spoke in many ways and many parts to the people. But in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son. So there's gotta be a gathering. There's gotta be a commonality of all people to, to, to know Jesus. Now he commands everyone to repent and, and receive him. But the ignorance definitely plays a part. And that's the part that we don't know. How could, how could Jesus say in John 15, 22, if I hadn't come, they'd have no sin? Or in, in 9, 41, in John 9, 41, if, if you were blind, you'd have no sin. But because you say, we see, therefore your sin remains on you. He, he, he's, he's giving hints that ignorance plays a part. In Romans chapter two, verses 14 through 16 is probably the most telling verses. In, in Romans 2, uh, 14 through 16, he says this. He says, when Gentiles who don't know the law of God do the things contained in the law that God requires, they bear witness that God has already written his law in their hearts. Their conscience either accusing them or excusing them. And that's how they'll be de judged on the day of the Lord Jesus. You may say, well, what's the, the use of preaching? Because Jesus said, I've come to give you an, a lot, an abundant life. You know, he, he's got it covered for people who are ignorant and they just know him as the creator, but there's a higher revelation that the creator's name is Jesus. And it's up to us to tell people about him because we're part of the royal family. There's an invitation to be part of the royal family. But, but the hows and whys beyond that, Jesus is the way, Jesus is, it's not universalism or, or anything like that, but there is that element there of ignorance that Jesus talked about that, that's it's not addressed any further, so I don't want to speculate. Have I asked the Lord about dietary laws? I haven't. He put, he put the teeth in my head to eat meat. <clears throat> my O positive blood type likes meat and dark vegetables. I don't, I don't really care for carbs. I'll eat, I'll eat the occasional roll or uh, pasta needs to be, pasta needs to be something with good in it. In fact, I just, I just copied a cold pasta salad that involves spinach and some olives and everything else. It was on, I don't know, I don't know why I saw it. I, but anyway, it was somewhere today and I saw it on my phone and I hit, I hit the send it to myself, send myself the recipe. But, but uh, you know, Barb, my wife, is a carbohydrate person. You know, gotta have something sweet after every meal, that sort of thing for me. I don't, give me some dark chocolate, just a pinch between my cheek and gum, you know? Some dark chocolate, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> That'll date you if you recognize that expression of just a pinch between your cheek and gum. <laughs> but that's about, a, uh, you know, the sweets. And my wife's, uh, my wife's um, chocolate chip oatmeal cookies. Yeah. I went through a time, honestly, I went through a time where Haagen-Dazs chocolate, chocolate chip ice cream was a habit of mine. We lived in a, in a tri-level house and my recliner was sit there on the, in the bottom level looking at the TV and on the, the next level was the kitchen and there was a refrigerator freezer. And I'm telling you, every night I'd get, I'd get home and I'd get tired and the news is coming on, I'm paying attention to the, to the weather and I'm telling you that haagen called to me <laughs> at about 10.10 10 every night, eat me. I mean, seriously, 
you know, let me thaw a little bit and then put some in your mouth and just feel the chocolate melt by the body temperature. And I'm playing this, I'm waiting for the weather to come on, that's all I want. But it's like, just a tablespoon won't hurt. You know, and then half a pint later, I've got this little uh, carve around the edges, you know, cause you hold it like this and then the, the heat comes through the cardboard and the edges get really soft. And I had to overcome that. It is a hard one. I haven't had haagen chocolate chocolate chip in ages, but I've got a stash of dark chocolate above the toaster oven. May you ask a question? Yeah, take us out of this, please. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard. Yes. For the sake of those listening, yes, she, you're, you're quoting 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, where he's quoting Isaiah. And um, okay, hold it. You brought up two separate subjects. She okay, but understand the verse in context. She's talking about First Corinthians chapter two, verse nine, and the verse says, "I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love Him." And then it says but God has revealed these things to us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man except a man's spirit? Even so, no, one, no man knows the things of God except his spirit. Therefore, we have received the spirit of the Lord so that we can know the things that have been freely given to us by God. What do I look forward to? <clears throat> When Barb and I got married in September of 1978, she got pregnant with Chris the following March. We, in the meantime, had graduated from Bible school and moved to Colorado because that's what he told us in college that we would do. We moved to the Boulder, Colorado area. We were just, you know, newlyweds. Chris was born in December. We moved to Boulder in May. Barb nearly lost her life. Here's what happened. I graduated from school and we'd already been told in September of 77 that the Lord wanted us to go to Boulder, Colorado. So when I graduated from Bible school in May of 1980, I knew by the spirit we were supposed to go in September. I was so eager that we rented a duplex sight unseen. We lived in Tulsa, graduated from Bible school, rented a duplex sight unseen and to move in May right after graduation. I knew it was wrong. I knew the timing was September. We moved up, rented our, our, all our worldly goods in the back of a U-Haul truck, our little six-month-old baby with us. I did the brilliant thing of locking the duplex key in the, in the desk that would be like for my office, and because it was so heavy, it was packed first right at the front of the truck. And so there I am at midnight, parked in front of this duplex, crawling around like some spider flattening itself against the roof, you know, the inside roof of the thing, trying to get the key. It's not a place we would have moved to if I'd seen it, but it fit the budget and we moved. A couple, three weeks later in June, uh, Barb was uh, returning from a Bible study at the church. She had Chris in the car seat. She locked herself out of the house, out of the duplex. I was in Boulder working and she was 20, 25 minutes away where, where we lived. She said, you know, I'm just gonna crawl through the window above the bathroom that's unlocked. I'll just crawl through the window. She said her angel, she knew her angel was right next to her saying, don't do it, go get John, get his keys. And she's arguing, that takes money. It's 20 minutes away. And, and I don't want to bother him at work and, and had all the arguments. She got up there. She got to the edge to climb up on the window above the shower. The angel said, don't do it. Go get John. Get his keys. Now it'll just take a minute. She sat on the window ledge, put her full weight on the shower curtain rod, thinking it was, it was attached to the wall. Her face went forward. She hit her right cheek against the toilet with full force. She had uh, skull fractures radiating back. Over here, her eye dropped because she crushed her cheek. 
I got a call from work from the emergency room saying, your wife is here, you need to come. I said, what, she cut herself with a, a knife in the kitchen or something? She said, no, sir, it's much more serious than that. You need to come right away. She, to her credit, I don't know how she did it. I so admire Barb because she's so strong. She, didn't, she maintained consciousness. The, the folks next to us were, were Mexican. We didn't know any Spanish, but the lady was nice enough to take Chris. What Barb was thinking was, it's a warm day. Chris is in the car seat. She'd left him in the car seat. If she passed out, he would die of heat, of the heat being locked in the car seat at six months old. They took it. I go up there. The, the, surgeon, the surgeon did did the surgery to use plastic to rebuild an eye socket, um, wire together uh, her eyebrow and everything. And I mean, you know, we're 22 years of age and my beautiful wife now has a crushed face and he, they had to rebuild it. And the, and the doctor said, you know, she's gonna have blurred vision. She, she, she completely destroyed the nerve that runs vertically down the, down the cheek and through the, the cheekbone. And, and she's gonna be like a stroke victim, a palsy on that side. She's gonna have blurred vision, double vision. Uh, we put her get together the best we could, but you're, that's what she's looking at for the rest of her life. And of course, <laughs> she came out of it and we just said, you know, we reject that. I got a tape of, uh, I believe it was Kenneth Hagin uh, quoting uh, healing scriptures. And because we know the Lord and, and everything else, we prayed one time. I laid hands on her. I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Just use the name once. And then we began to worship. She listened to tape and everything that came out her mouth was worship and thanks. Within seven days after that surgery, she started to get feeling back. Within 30 days, she was completely whole. To this, to this day, to this day, only because the years have gone by, you can see a little bit of an indentation there above her right eyebrow. But she's never had blurred vision, double vision, or anything else. She's totally healed. I'm to blame for that because I knew by the Spirit we were supposed to move in September. This accident happened in June. It's my fault. It nearly cost my wife and my son their lives. That's, we learned early on, you don't mess with the timing of the Lord. And what we also learned was that June, July, and August were difficult, li difficult times. Uh, I, for, for a couple days, I worked three jobs. But the rest of that time, it was two jobs. It was all I could do to make the $345 a month rent in our little duplex and keep food on the table and, and you know, gas in the car. I worked hard for those three months. I found out the Father God doesn't move up his agenda just because of our disobedience. In September, a church opened up, another job opened up. Suddenly our pay got better. Everything started falling into place right when we should have been there. But for those three months, we nearly died. Learned, that's a tough lesson to learn at 22 years of age, but I learned it and she learned it. And we never missed the Lord like that again in that same way. No. Um, so our son Chris was born with the umbilical cord around his neck in a slipknot. And he rolled like a log and he never spoke for the first three years, three and a half years of his life. And at the time we rented a townhouse and Barb, as I shared, almost had a breakdown just in desperation crying out and said, Father, you've got to do something. I can't go on like this. My son's just like a little log rolling around. And, and that's when, after that desperate prayer, she heard upstairs in his bedroom, she heard, mommy. And she ran upstairs and he was sitting in his crib. From that time on, he, he was able then regained uh, with bright leg braces to walk with a walker. He began talking, talks a mile a minute to this day. He is, he is the hit of the party. Even though he's mentally four years old, age-wise he's 43. People ask, I, kn I know what happened, I know why, and I also know why he's not healed. And I know that Chris is, con and beyond that, I know that Chris is content. Jesus has talked to him and said that he's gonna walk through the mountains with him. And so Chris is content with that. I told him, I said, I need to go tell people about Jesus this weekend. Can, is it okay if I go? He said, yeah, you can go, Dad. So I'll pick him up next Friday instead of this Friday. You, you pick him up Friday mornings. What do I look forward to? an adult relationship with my mentally four-year-old son. That's what I look forward to. 
a couple months ago, me being very tired of yet more salty, the singing songbook and Veggie Tales and Donut Man and some of the other kids things that we've listened to for the last 40 years, 40 years of four year old. You know, just think about that. And he was at home for the first 24 years of his life. But eventually it was either live on the streets and take care of Chris or, or earn a living and, and put him in a group home. And that's where I shared, you know, that decision where the Lord was, was there in the bedroom. And when we made the decision to put him, did I share with this or was it just privately? I did not? Privately. Okay. So we found a group home, but it was two hours away from our house. How do you tell a four-year-old you can't live at home anymore? His little brothers graduated high school, went off to college, et cetera. There's Chris at home. We're taking care of him. He needs help on and off the toilet, bathe, shave, all of that. That's my responsibility. When I was gone, when I was ministering, he would be in an adult diaper. And when he would mess his pants and everything else, it would make him angry. Sometimes he'd hit Barb. Sometimes he'd lash out in anger because of the embarrassment, because he's still a man. And his mom is wiping his rear, you know, because he's wearing the depends. He's got that understanding. So we moved him to the group home. They told us it'd be a couple months before we have an opening. They called within a week or two. We weren't mentally adjusted to that. And Barb and I had laid in bed that night when he was to go the next day. And we, How can we do this to him? No one's going to take care of him like we will. And we're moving him two hours away. How can we tell our four-year-old, mental four-year-old son, you know, he's 24 at the time. How, how do we tell him that he can't live at home? Later, after we made the move, he would request to call us and he would be in tears. I'm sorry, I pooped my pants. Please let me come home. I'm sorry, I peed, please. Break our hearts over and over and over again. But we're doing, we're living for you, Lord. But before that, that decision, we laid in bed that night and just said, Father, take him home. You know, we would much rather live 50 years or whatever on the earth knowing our son is in heaven. We've both been to heaven. You know, we know what it's like. We know there's relatives there, et cetera. We'd rather miss him for 50 years on earth than to have him endure a group home and, and being raised by others and us not being there. And, and then that's, I, and then Barb drifted off to sleep and I was just saying, I was just saying, Father, put it on me. You know, I know how to be healed. I know to walk in health. Just, just put it on me. Let him be whole. Give me his cerebral palsy and let me trust you and believe you and, and use my faith and, and, and receive healing. I know how to receive revelation and, and do that. You just, you pray all kinds of things like that. And suddenly Jesus was in the room. Barb, Barb had rolled over and gone to sleep and the Lord is suddenly there. Without any other greeting or anything else, he just looks at me and he says, would you have Chris miss out on the fullness of his reward? by me taking him home early, bringing him home early, just because you feel bad for having to put him in a group home? I said, Lord, I am so sorry. I said, I, I had not even considered the fullness of his reward. No, I want Chris to have the fullness of his reward. I don't want him, whatever he's got coming when he gets to heaven, I want him to have the fullness. I don't want to cheat him out of anything. I said, but two conditions. I said, one, that he never be neglected and two, that he never be abused. And the Lord looked at me and he said, done. And then he was gone. And that's then we went through all of that with the tears. And finally we said, okay, we've got to move close to him. Because being two hours away, we couldn't, um, <clears throat> we couldn't be, I couldn't go up there, but you know, every few weeks until May of 08. What caused it is May of 08, I walked in to the group home to pick him up and they, I was met at the door just outside the, the manager's office. And she said, Chris has lost the will to live. It's been about a month since you've been here and he's down to his danger weight of about close to 138 pounds. He no longer fulfills the requirements for an ICFMR and we have to discharge him to a nursing home. Intermediary care facility for the mentally retarded. They've done away with the MR part because they don't, that's not politically correct. So it's an ICF now. Um, but he no longer fits that definition, so we have to discharge him to a, to a nursing home because he's given up the will to live. And I said, mm. I said, what if he regained the will to live? So I began coming up every, I spent two days, drive two hours each way, I get him bathed, shaved, take him out to McDonald's, to Sonic, whatever he wanted, 
spend the day with dad, put, take him back in the evening, come up the next day, repeat. Pretty soon we're spending 500 a month and I told Barb, we can pay a mortgage with what we're spending in gas and food and everything else. And there was a long story to it, but the father showed me a house with a wheelchair ramp already set. And, um, and, and this, this may help somebody, you're discerning the Lord's will. Once we had it set about what we could afford and we needed to be within, we decided that we need to be within 30 minutes of his group home. Then I thought through the process, John, you're, you know, you're, you're, in your, you're approaching 50 years old. This is gonna be a major investment because you don't have any savings, you, you know, being in the ministry and such and just hadn't, didn't have anything. And, uh, but we had some money to put down, but no retirement or, or savings account or anything. <laughs> in fact, one time, <laughs> side trip. One time I was complaining to the father about not having a savings account because I had a woman sit in my office, member of our congregation. Her husband was shifting from being the, worship, the uh, music leader, music teacher at her high school to starting a career with, as, a, as an insurance broker. And they're gonna pay him for three years. And you know, he had to build up the business and all that. She was so afraid, she said, it's such a transition. We may have to break into savings. And I'm sitting there going, savings? What is that? We're relying on people to bring us fruits and vegetables from their gardens and, and the family that owns the dairy who brought us uh, you know, the milk to keep the boys in milk and the other family that owns a ranch and they bring us a, a side of beef to, for the freezer. And, and all that, I mean, and you know, we might have to break into savings. I was driving down the road and I said, Father, I just would love to have a savings or something. And, and he said, why would, you want to put your, why would you want to put your money in there? And suddenly there was a vision before me. And, and it was a Thursday and people were doing business as normal. I knew this in the vision. And then the banks shut down and it was a Friday. And Saturday, I saw people banging on the door wanting their money. And on Monday, it opened up and the dollar was worth 50% of what it had been on Thursday. They had devalued the US dollar. And he said, why would you wanna put your money in there? In other words, he was saying, John, I'll take care of you. Yeah. Hey, we've got bank accounts, don't, don't worry about that. I mean, we've got bank accounts, but I'm aware that, you know, you can't run up trillions of dollars worth of debt without something being affected at some point down the road. You gotta pay the piper sometimes. So anyway, that's somewhere off in the future. Hopefully we won't be here for that. Um, but anyway, so, so when we determined, we did our due diligence and then prayed and the Lord showed me a vision of a house with a wheelchair ramp and a section on Grand Lake of the Cherokees, which is Northeast Oklahoma, which is 30 minutes from where Chris's group home is. And I saw this oval on the Western shore and I knew that's where the house that the father had for us was located. So I spent two days proving that I'd heard right by going everywhere except where he had shown me. That lake has a thousand miles of shoreline and I spent two days driving around, looking at other real estate, looking at just on my own, not with a broker or anything else, just driving on my own, seeing what was for sale, going you know, way over the 30 minute time frame for driving and everything just to see, and nothing bore witness, nothing was right. So on the third day, I drove right to where he had shown me. And there was a for sale sign by owner out there. And he'd given me a price. And so we ended up contacting, it was a Baptist pastor. And he said he'd just put the sign up 30 minutes earlier on their way out of their, to visit their, uh, their, their adult um, son, I think, or maybe it was daughter in Idaho. And we ended up working a deal and, and they carried the mortgage. This is 2008 when the banks are shutting down. Nobody's loaning anything. We've got some money to put down. There's a man in that Baptist church in Wyandotte, Oklahoma, who owned the bank. He was an elder in the church. We walked into his bank. He had the note and everything else. There wasn't any credit check. There wasn't any paperwork. It was the elder in the church. The pastor said, would you do this for me? We did it and we just paid them and were able to pay, even pay off the house. It's just a double wide, you know, and that we've gradually turned into a handicap accessible home. We've added on to it and made it so that Chris can roll around in his wheelchair and all that. But, you know, I've been to heaven, so I'm not really impressed by things on the earth. You know, I can, I can be happy anywhere. But, um, so what am I looking forward to? I'm looking for Chris being whole. A couple of months ago, as I said, tired of veggie tales and everything yet again on the playlist on my phone and 
the car and everything else. I said, Father, I just long for that adult conversation with Chris. And suddenly I saw a vision. I'm driving, but I see the vision. I don't know how that works, but I was driving, but I also saw the vision. And I saw Chris sitting down and I was standing behind him and he was seated and he was full. He was, he'd be about a bit, as big of, of, as me, normal. He's got his mom's brunette hair, a touch of auburn to it, but, but mostly brunette. And he was filled out and there were people in front of him. Some sitting, you know, with their legs crossed, others just sitting in there listening to him. Father, what am, I, what am I looking at? He said, you're seeing Chris in heaven. And I said, what's he talking about? And he said, he's talking about what it was like to be handicapped, to live in a damaged body and have to be dependent on everyone. He's sharing his life and his story. And I recognized a couple of the people in the vision. I recognized them as caregivers. They were Christians. And they were fascinated learning his perspective and learning what he'd gone through. Amazing. I've shared in my book, Pursuing the Seasons of God, and I'll say that again to anybody online or whatever, just email me. I'll send you the PDF of Pursuing the Seasons of God. Yeah, C-W-O-W-I at AOL.com. Pursuing the Seasons. Well, when you read the book, you'll know what the seasons are. But it's, it's some of the early visitations with the Lord and some of the behind the scenes of the things that, that he's shown me, some of which I've mentioned, but... but in various details, but it's different, way, different ways that he moves in our lives and different elements that we have. But there was a man in there, I mentioned the deaf and mute man in the church named Will, W-I-L-L. -L. One Sunday morning at 11 a.m., well, here's the thing, <laughs> here's the thing. Will, I recognize that time where the Lord came and talked to Will you know, when I was down on and whatever and the Lord came and refreshed and, and Will, I, I could see in the spirit different times that Will was greatly affected by the Lord, but he's a deaf mute. He can't say anything, can't do anything about it. And pastor, and, and you've got to understand, Will is very zealous for the Lord, loves the Lord. But pastor asked me, could you communicate to Will that he doesn't need to come down front for every altar call? If you need help getting pregnant, we're gonna pray for, for fertility issues. Would you come down front? Here comes Will. If you need deliverance from drugs or alcohol or any sort of addict, come down front. Here comes Will. I mean, he'd come down and, and pastor said, you seem to have a rapport with him somehow able to communicate. Can you just let him know that he doesn't have to come down front? I said, you know, you know he loves the presence of the Lord. And, and he's very innocent and everything, and I was not successful in communicating to him. <laughs> but I saw this one time, and I saw the shaft of light coming down on Will. He was down front, and I'm up on the arena. I, I didn't have a, anything to do in that service, so I came in and sat at the top of the arena. So I'm looking down to the platform, and there's Will. And the shaft of light is on him. And I see the Father talking to him. I see his words as print saying, my son, I appreciate your hard work. In the ages to come, you'll be a teacher of many. Many will sit at your feet and learn of you. And the father was just pointing out, and Will's just going like, he's just excited. And I know that he knows that the father is talking to him, but he can't communicate it. He's deaf and he can't talk. And I said, father, why don't you heal him? Think of what it would be for a deaf mute in Tulsa, Oklahoma to get healed. Think about all that. And he said, I enjoy his worship. I said, yes, but Father, think about what it would be like for a deaf mute. I mean, your, your glory, your praise, I mean, it'd be in the newspaper, it'd be everything. It'd be quite the story. And, and, I, said, and I said, think about everything that he's missing in life. He's probably on welfare or something like that, on disability. Think about everything that he's missing, job and career and home, owning, home ownership and driving a car and all that. And the father was almost indignant. I see to it, he gets everything he needs. I see to it, he has everything he needs. I said, but father, wouldn't it be amazing if you healed him? One last time. Wouldn't it be amazing if you healed him? And he said, he finds his delight in me. And that's enough for Will. 
couple months later, I was in a Taco Bueno, which is a regional chain in Tulsa. And Taco Bueno, especially the crunchy potato burrito. Ooh. Muy bueno. And I walk in and there is Will cleaning the lobby. And he motions over to me and I don't understand, but he's like motioning to the back. And he's, he's, he's motioning to me and, and everything. And finally I called the manager and I said, I, he said, you know him? I said, yeah, I know him from, from church. I didn't know he worked here. He said, yeah, he cleans the lobby and empties the trash and straightens out the boxes. And he said, he's wanting to show you how nicely he stacked the back. We had a shipment come in today and he wants to show you what a good job he did in the back room in the, in the storage area. And so he let me you know, look at it and everything like that. And I remembered what I saw the father say, my son, I appreciate your hard work. There's just so much I've seen, so much. And the father is so good. <sighs> anyway, could go on, but we never got to the questions, did we? Maybe we answered some of them. You have a question? Okay. Pastor's asking me if I can tell about prayer and tongues. Okay. Let me take a drink of water. I'm telling you, in the high desert, this guy from humid Oklahoma. Whew. And why in the world do you guys have so many black cars driving around and dark cars? I rented a little, a little, a little Kia something or other. My rental car is a little Kia something, and I have to really pull myself out. It's not as tall as my Subaru back home. And, and you should see me, I'm like a grasshopper unfolding his legs. I mean, the car is big enough, but it's low. And I open that door and I put my arm against the paint to kind of bring myself up and out. I think I got almost a first degree burn. I don't care what you say, it's 110, but it's a dry heat. I, I, so's my oven at home. I just, I just... Um, yeah, we, I'll, I'll close with, I'll, with sharing that. Um, there's some things, a couple things related to it. Um, if I could be allowed just, uh, just to take a quick um, meander here. I had asked the Lord, can we, do we have the right to send angels, to command angels? Because that was a common practice and all that in, at the time. You know, it was very common. I said, can we command angels? And he looked at me and said, you don't even know how to pray as you should. What makes you think you know how to tell an angel what to do? And I said, well, can I have chapter and verse on that? And he said, have you not read when I was in the garden? And I said that I could ask the father and he would send 12 legions of angels. The angels belong to the father. He said, have you not read what I told the church when I said that if they would not deny me, if they would overcome, I will confess them before the Father and his angels. That's Revelation 3, 5, by the way. If you wanna look it up, Matthew 26, 53 and Revelation 3, 5. Both of them say that the angels belong to the Father. He said, you don't even know how to pray as you should. What makes you think you know how to tell an angel what to do? The angels belong to the Father and he commands them. And I, and I said, about that prayer, I said, why tongues? The reference, the reference to the scripture was Romans 8, 26, that we don't know how to pray as we should, but the Holy Spirit takes hold of our infirmities and prays utterance, which can't even be uttered, an utterance that can't even be done in articulate speech. Romans 8, 26, 27. You don't know how to pray as you should. I said, so why tongues? It's so controversial. And he paused and he said this. He said, if you can receive this, for the most part, the Father and I work by invitation in the earth. Yet we retain our rights as creator. For the most part, we work, we function by invitation in the earth while retaining our rights as creator. And of course, you know what I said. I need chapter and verse. I need to know more about this. 
And then a whole thing just kind of the way in the book of Acts it said he made known unto them by the scripture, by the Holy Spirit, or in Luke 24, he made known, he opened their understanding by the Spirit to understand things. Suddenly all these things came running back to me. Um, the ambulance that goes by that I say a quick prayer for, or when I'm with Chris, Chris will go, we better pray. And he'll put his, 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 he only has use of his right hand. He put his hand out to grab mine and we pray. Father, I pray for whoever's in that ambulance or wherever they're going and that you aid everybody and make sure that the people don't go to hell. Do everything you can to aid their healing and their recovery in the name of Jesus. And Chris will go, amen. Because he doesn't pray the, the full prayer. He lets me pray. And I realized that that person in the ambulance may not have anybody in their life who's praying for them. However, when you say, Father, I'm praying for that person in the ambulance, you are authorizing the father to become involved in their life because you're his kid. So legally, the father can become involved in that person in that ambulance's life, in that person's life. And so he is then legally able to assist that person or those caregivers. Okay, all these things are start going through my mind. The people that may not have anybody, the, the lady in the grocery store that you can sense that she's depressed and she's got this little cloud over her. And so, Father, I, pr I pray for that lady. The spirit of depression, leave her in the name of Jesus. Father, just minister to her. Let her know you. You may be the only person praying for her, but you're legally authorizing the Father to become involved. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They work by invitation. And maybe that person has not invited him to become involved in their life yet. I didn't ask him to become involved till I was 16. But my mom was praying for me. So he was at work because that prayer by my mom gave him legal access to work on me. So when the Lord said that, he said, you don't know how to pray as you should. He said, so if you can receive this, for the most part, the father and I work by invitation in the earth while retaining our rights as creator. And he said, he said, the earth has been delegated to man. And he said, when, when something is delegated, it means you're giving charge of something to someone else. And he said this, so the father had to find a way to bypass man's ignorance because man doesn't know how to pray. So he gives him a language that he never learned and then fills it with his knowledge, his will, his emotions, and puts it in your spirit, then you pray it right back to him, closing the loop and making a legal transaction. And in that day, no one, no being will be able to say that we were unfair or unjust, for all things will be revealed that we have been fair and just and right in all things. He was emphatic on it, he said that a couple times. It closes the loop. It's legal. We have great authority. I got to know a man named T.L. Osborne uh, because our, the Bible school was in his world headquarters. And so I'd have him speak at chapel and different things. And, and along the lines of authority, okay? And so there was a, a pastor from Kenya who was in town and he wanted to know if he could meet T.L. So I gave him a call and T.L. was very gracious and invited us over to his house. So while T.L. and this pastor were talking, talking about you know, the crusades that T.L. had, the crusades that T.L. had in Kenya and all that stuff, I sat to the side and just let them talk. But his angel was suddenly right next to me. And I was sitting there saying, Father, what is this anointing, this presence that I feel with T.L.? You know, it's not an apostle exactly. It's not like an evangelist. It's, it's, it, there's a witness in my spirit, but I can't put a finger on it. I can't quite define that. What is it? And the angel spoke with a booming voice and he said, this man has authority with God. And I said, why? He said, for the great numbers of people, the great numbers of people that he has brought to him. We all can come boldly to the throne. We all have a certain amount of authority before the Father God. And you just have to realize that. You have to realize the authority that we have to come boldly to the throne. You've got authority in your family. You've got authority in your workplace. You've got authority in your neighborhood. Think about that. The spheres of authority. Whew. 
Maybe tomorrow when I share about that visitation and what the Lord taught me, we'll have time for some more questions. I'm not sure, but... Well, Father, it was kind of a scattershot tonight, Father God, but I just feel that what was shared need to be shared. Thank you for uh, the insights there at the beginning with the words of knowledge and different things about people and just your assurance, your peace in our spirits. Thank you that the eyes of our understanding are being enlightened, that we're learning the invitation that is extended to us, that we're filled with spiritual wisdom and spiritual knowledge. Thank you, Father, you're so gracious. Let the, it's an incorruptible seed, so let the things shared this weekend and just be pulled out even a month or two or whatever on down the road because it's alive and people will look back and say, oh, I received that revelation then, yes. I'm, I understand now. Let it be so, Father, in the name of Jesus. You know, um, I, I have a saying that about revelation and, and it explains the difference between your head and your spirit and it is this. Revelation is something you always knew, but never realized. Revelation is something you always knew, but you never realized. Some of the things that I'm sharing in your spirit, it's going like, yeah, that makes sense. That resonates, that hits. And your mind is going, I never realized that. And yet somehow I knew that already. I knew that somehow. I just had never analyzed it, had never realized it. So I hope that's been the way it's been tonight. So thank you. Amen.